Hi, it's Emil Guillermo, the host of the PETA podcast. The generational storm of December 2022 has already claimed dozens of human lives. It means untold numbers of animals have also been lost. Hard to believe, but there are some animals who are left outside during the winter months. With that in mind, we reprise this episode with tips on how to make sure you're doing all you can for the animals during the cold season on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, survival tips for animals in cold weather. Every year, and we hear reports of dogs who have frozen to death. And, you know, for everyone we hear of, there are probably countless more that don't get reported. Emily Allen goes out in the field every day as a member of PETA's Community Animal Project. And when the weather gets cold, it can be heartbreaking. And we certainly urge everyone if they to not turn a blind eye to an animal who's left outdoors in the freezing weather and to report it to authorities immediately. And so I think it's important to know that even every winter we hear about dogs who are who have literally frozen to death. Even if the cold temperatures don't kill an animal, the animal can still be suffering from the cold. Emily talks with Emil about what you can do in the cold weather for your companion animals, next on the PETA Podcast. But first, thanks again for joining us here at the PETA Podcast, and we'll start a new season in our next episode. Please share a link with friends. Let them know the animals have a voice on the PETA Podcast. And if you just found us, we are binge ready. Yeah, there's lots to listen to on the PETA Podcast. Have you fallen off your vegan New Year's resolution already? Don't worry. PETA's vegan mentors are here to help in episode 25. I know it's cold, but your Canada Goose jacket is cold-blooded. There's better ways to stay warm and vegan. Listen to episode 44. And animal testing is always an important issue. Hear how one area of reform enabled PETA to save millions, literally millions of animals. Episode 23. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. And now to our episode. PETA routinely tracks the cold weather gripping our nation because weather has a real effect on animals too often just left outside. Here's my conversation with Emily Allen with PETA's Community Animal Project on the PETA podcast. It's cold out there. It is. You know, this thing about the weather, it's so cold. They're they're warning people on TV and the news. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if people really understand what to do, but PETA, PETA does understand. And you actually, you're, you're part of the team that has this storm tracker that examines Mm -hmm. the forecasts and, and alerts and the temperature drops. What kinds of situations are you seeing near PETA's Norfolk, Virginia headquarters right now and, and expand it out to, to the nation as well? Unfortunately, we're still seeing um, dogs who are tied to the end of their chains 24-7 in all weather extremes. And this is the time of year where it really um, becomes critical for us if we hear of a dog who is staying outside during um, this extreme weather that we're experiencing. And, you know, in the areas that our community animal project and our field worker service, we are trying to pass laws as fast as we can to um, stop these dogs from being chained outside 24-7. We're trying to spay and neuter animals as fast as we can so they don't contribute to the overpopulation problem. But unfortunately, there are still dogs that we know of who are being kept outside in all weather extremes and and they have nobody else to help them. And uh, so we actually go into the 
poorest of neighborhoods and we do everything we can to try to improve conditions. And this time of year specifically, we're, um, we're stuffing dog houses with straw bedding. A lot of people use, um, they use old we, uh, blankets or towels um, to try to help keep dogs a little bit warmer. But unfortunately, when that gets wet, those those items tend to freeze. And so that's why we offer free straw bedding to help keep dogs a little bit warmer. And um, of course, our um, we have a free dog house program. So we um, our dog houses are custom designed, especially for this it, kind of frigid temperature that we're experiencing to really help try to insulate the dog's body heat. And so they um, it gives them a fighting chance when we have these sub freezing temperatures. It seems odd that I guess for some people, you know, putting a dog on a chain uh, is that's the way they, they, they deal with dogs. That's the way they treat them. Uh, mm-hmm. In the summer, it's not great. In these frigid temperatures, it's even worse. What, what gets me is that people don't realize that, that dogs get cold, that these temperatures mean something. And PETA mm-hmm. monitors, they, they have these storm trackers that that monitors the situations. I, I know you're trying to change the, the laws in terms of, you know, 24 seven dog dogs on a chain, but what about the temperature idea? I mean, why is it that people don't get the idea that dogs get cold and that it's not a good idea to have the dog out there in these sub you know, zero temperatures? That's kind of the million dollar question. We all ask our ourselves that question all the time. And I think if we had an answer, uh, we would hopefully not be seeing all these neglected animals that we do see every single day. But, you know, I think um, it's important for people to realize that uh, just because dogs have fur, that doesn't mean they're any more, um, they don't, you know, they're any better equipped to handle the freezing temperatures than we are. And if it's too cold for you to be outside, it's most certainly too cold for your dog to be outside. And we really try to hit that, you know, hit that message home to to people, especially this coming week when temperatures are going to um, dip down potentially to the single digits. It seems like it's common sense that it's if it's cold for you, it's going to be cold for the dog. But there are so many incidences that PETA lists where you find mm-hmm. these dogs that are out there, uh, uh, six puppies abandoned outside a, a clinic during freezing temperatures. I mean, that's surprising that it's a veterinary clinic. Uh, dog left outside in Pennsylvania, 26 degree weather. Uh, and state police were, were reportedly filing charges. Is there a, a, can it be animal neglect or animal abuse if you leave your dog outside? Oh, absolutely. I think um, many jurisdictions take those kind of complaints very seriously. And, you know, we certainly urge everyone if they to not turn a blind eye to an animal who's left outdoors in the freezing weather and to report it to authorities immediately. And, you know, and also I think it's important to know that even every winter we hear about dogs who are who have literally frozen to death. But um even if the cold temperatures don't kill an animal, the animal can still be suffering from the cold. So, um, it, it, you know, but every year and we hear reports who, of dogs who have frozen to death. And, you know, for everyone we hear of, there are probably countless more that don't get reported. PETA does something there in Norfolk. But what should people mm-hmm. do when they when they hear that cold weather is coming? Like, just like we're seeing these news flashes uh, just you know, from the beginning of the week, it's probably going to be here for the next few days. What mm-hmm. should people do? What is the proper way to take care of your dog? Or, or and, and what should people do when they see dogs that are out there on, on a on a chain or yeah. see dogs that are being neglected? For most of us, when um, you and I, when we uh, in the cold temperatures, I mean, the most important thing we can do is to keep animals indoors when the temperature is approaching freezing. And and that's especially true for puppies and kittens and also older animals and small animals. Um, and, and especially true for short-haired animals like pointers or beagles or 
pit bulls or rottweilers. And, you know, and the sad part is those are typically the animals that we see most often outdoors are the ones that are the least equipped to handle this kind of cold weather. But um, I, I think for those of us, you know, who are going about our day, uh, short hair animals could certainly benefit from a warm sweater or coat when they go out for walks. And don't allow your dog or cat to roam outdoors. I mean, that is really should be a good rule of thumb for any time of year, but especially during the cold weather. And then one important thing that um, I actually had no idea when I first started at PETA that this happens, but during the cold weather, cats tend to climb under the hoods of car engines to um, an effort to keep warm. So um, it's always a good rule of thumb if you're living in a cold climate or the temperatures are below freezing to bang on the hood of your car before you start your engine. Uh, so the animals have an opportunity, or cats especially, to um, to get out and not um, and not suffer an injury. Wait, wait a minute. Cats climb into the engines. Yeah, we. I mean, we hear of that happening happening all the time. They they climb into the engines um, in an effort to stay a little bit warmer during during the cold weather. Uh, unfortunately, we get stories of of kind people, good Samaritans, who have started up their engine and either heard a horrific noise or um or the cat has jumped out when they weren't when they weren't expecting the animal to and so it's a you know good rule of thumb to and a very easy thing for us all to prep get into the habit of doing is is banging on the hood of the of your car before you start the engine boy you know i've never heard that uh but i imagine that if you're if you're a cat and there, there, there are hundreds of community cats out there now mm -hmm. uh, through these, uh, and a lot of feral cats out there. So, banging on your hood—that's a, that's a good, that's a good tip, mm -hmm. especially in the cold yeah, weather. I, yeah. Definitely, and just a good habit to get into. Does it worry you when you see the the storms coming in, or you see that that bad weather, cold weather is coming in? Because you must have in your mind that that means mm -hmm. that a certain percentage of dogs and cats are going to be in danger. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, a, a lot of us field workers have talked about this when we were kids. We all used to get really excited about extreme weather, you know, be it a, a snowstorm or even a cold snap or um, or heavy rain. But um, now that we we know better, now that we know all the um, the extremes that dogs and cats can suffer, I don't think any of us anymore are looking forward to weather extremes. And it's, um, it, you know, we lose sleep at night thinking about the dogs who are still tied up 24 seven and, and trapped at the end of their chains with nowhere else to go. And, um, you know, and that uh, for a lot of us who go out into the field every day, we've, we've grown a, a special attachment or a special bond to these animals that we meet on a, sometimes a weekly basis in the field. And, um, it, you know, all of us see our own animals inside cozy and, in you know tucked away in our beds or in a um, next to a space heater and you know we put extra blankets on top of them to help um, make sure that they stay warm and then you know unfortunately we we know of all of hundreds of dogs who are who are still trapped outside 24 7 who aren't afforded those luxuries you know when you are seeing these dogs and maybe you have the good fortune to see or meet and talk to an owner what do they say do they say anything about why they do what they do or do they have do they does a light bulb go off and they say oh yeah i should bring him in i should bring the the dog or the cat in it depends and sl and change unfortunately comes about slowly in a, a lot of areas we go to we spend a lot of our time in very poor, very rural, very impoverished communities where, unfortunately, sometimes you go into a neighborhood and there are maybe 10 houses on the street and almost all 10 houses have a, uh, a dog penned or tied up in the backyard. And so, it, it you know, it's a matter of educating people, which we are which we do every single day and to really show people that dogs are part of the family and dogs deserve to stay inside. And I think, you know, as hard as that is 
for us to comprehend that that would even that we need to educate somebody on that, that um, many of the people that we deal with every day, they have never known an inside dog before. That is a foreign concept to them. And, you know, and that's, um, I think, even trying to urge somebody to keep their animal inside during weather extremes as, you know, when I first started, I would have thought nobody would possibly do that. And, you know, a lot of it, it, it's not people intentionally trying to be cruel. It's just they they have never been taught better. And that's, you know, hopefully where our program comes in to to try to educate those people and really try to get them to view animals as part of the, the family. Okay, so let's say I'm one of those not so great companion animal type owners and I've mm-hmm. got my dog and my cat tethered outside. Well, usually they're dogs, but maybe I'm a really bad one. I've tethered a cat out there too. I'm one of those, you know, not so great people. Tell me what you tell me. What's wrong with tying up these dogs and what's wrong with tethering my cat outside? Aside from just the um, the animals being cold in frigid weather, we really try to appeal to people on a um, that dogs are are suffering psychologically from being tied up outside twenty four seven. They want they want attention. They want to be inside with you. They want they are pack animals that they're living in solitary confinement for a dog. That's the worst type of punishment we could invent for that for for that species. Um, and so we really try to appeal to them on that level, but also keeping dogs tied up outside 24 seven, they are more prone to injury, to being, uh, attacked by stray animals and all kinds of diseases from, um, that they, they are less likely to get when they, when they're kept indoors. What usually does it? How do you know that you made the case and have convinced someone what usually happens do they say oh i never thought about that i'm gonna do it right i'm gonna i'm gonna think about my dog or do they just say hey thanks thanks a lot see you later leave me alone well you know we i mean we we see a little bit of everything and i think um we you know even again things that may seem very common sense to um to you and I who are dog lovers or animal lovers, things like making sure dog has fresh water every single day, that may not be common sense to everybody out there. And um, so for us, you know, a small victory is um, trying to show somebody when we come out, we provide their dogs with fresh food and water. And the next time we go back, their dog has fresh food and water. And that may, you know, that's a small victory for, for us, which, um, uh, you know, just showing it, we see some of our, um, our, the clients that we deal with, uh, in the, especially in the summertime when dog, I mean, they need fresh water all year round, but it's especially critical in the warm temperatures. But, um, uh, you know, a lot of people put a bucket of water out there and if a dog knocks it over within the first five minutes, you know, there um some people's mentality is, well, I gave him water, that's his problem if he knocked it over. You know, and so just showing them that they have to have access to water at all times. And then you go back the next time or the time after that and you see they do have access to to fresh water. And so those are, you know, little things that that we consider a victory. So slow and steady wins the race. I mean, but you'll get there and this is all part of your work with PETA's Community Animal Project. Tell us more about your work with the, what the PETA calls the CAP uh, program. We have about a dozen field workers now who go out in the community every single day to really uh, rescue animals directly and, and provide help to animals in a hands-on fashion. And that's anything from replacing heavy chains with lightweight tie outs to providing dogs who are trapped at the end of their chain 24-7 with a better or a sturdier dog house. Uh, little things like providing flea and tick medication, especially in the summertime, making sure they have fresh food and water. And and also our, our big push is to try to sign people up for our spay-neuter clinic. 
And in a lot of the communities we go into, the the closest vet clinic may be a almost two hour drive away. And even if somebody is inclined to spay and neuter their animal, most of the um, the people we deal with in rural communities simply don't have the funds or don't have the transportation to to get their animals spayed and neutered. And so we really go at it from we go into the community, pick up animals from from their house or from their home and then provide door to door service to get uh, to make sure that those animals get spayed and neutered. And, you know, those are really the animals that are most likely to to breed and to contribute to the overpopulation problem. And so um, we really, you know, do what we can to get to the root of the problem and and try to spay animals, spay neuter animals as fast as we can. So there there aren't unwanted puppies or kittens I know a lot of people take issue with PETA's stance, you know, about sheltering and, and euthanasia and things of, of that nature. And they don't understand what PETA is actually doing to try to, to make the situation better. And as a member of the Community Animal Project, does it bother you sometimes when you hear those criticisms, knowing that you're out in the field every day? trying to do something to make an animal's life better, like these animals, like these dogs on the chain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you met our field workers, they are truly the hardest working, most compassionate people you will ever meet. And this this isn't a nine to five job. Animals need help 24 seven, especially when you're often dealing with animal emergencies. And I, you know, I think so many critics that they spent one day in the field with us and they really put a face to the the people who are out there doing this work every single day, I think I would think even the toughest critic would be silenced by the work that that our field workers are doing day in and day out. Um, we have an emergency pager phone where somebody is available 24-7 to respond to animal emergencies. And uh, that's done without complaint because this this is people's passion. You know, all of us we we've come to PETA and specifically this this division um, because we care about animals and because this is our passion and so uh, sometimes to hear um, criticism it you know it, it it's totally unfair and you know I think once again if you put a, a face to um, to the people who are who are running the PETA's animal shelter and PETA's community animal project I think you would have it, people, critics would change their tune very quickly. I, I think what the the Community Animal Project does, it seems, it's wonderful work, but it seems really basic in the sense that shouldn't people know how to provide basic care for their animals? I mean, it always seems like that component part is missing uh, when people take on an animal and then they, you know, put it, put it at the end of the chain and say, okay, you know, just leave it out there. It just seems cruel in that way. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, if I were to acquire a dog or a cat, I think I would truly think, can I make this commitment for the next 5, 10, 15 years? Do I have the funding available to provide not just food and water, but emergency care, routine vet visits? Uh, and, and, you know, I think um, there is a segment of society that does put a lot of effort into thinking, you know, a lot of thought goes in prior to to adopting an animal. But, you know, unfortunately, some of the people that we meet day in and day out, they um, they may think that all a dog or cat needs is is food and water and, you know, maybe a roof over their head uh, or some type of shelter. And that's, you know, and that. I think we've educated a good many people um, to who now know that acquiring an animal or, um, you know, being the guardian of an animal takes a whole lot more than just food and water. It requires potentially hundreds or thousands of dollars of veterinary bills and not to mention money aside, but just of your time and of your, um, you know, it requires a total lifestyle change in some situations. Yeah, and and not to mention it requires a certain amount of love, right? I mean, there's got to be a reason, unless they're just purely, you know, you, you put a dog in a chain to scare off the bad guys or something. I, sure. I don't know. 
there's some kind of function, but, but love's got to be in the equation too, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think um, many of us, even you know, who have come to PETA, um, but we found this field of work because we had a connection with a dog or a cat. And um, so, you know, that, that I think absolutely love is a component when it comes to um, acquiring a dog or a cat. And hopefully, you know, the, that will get you to extend your compassion to other other animals besides just dogs and cats. Okay, so you set me up here now, Emily. I, <laughs> I have to ask you, who is that animal that did it for you that said, this This is my life? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Most of us um, at PETA, and I think most of us here in this country, probably grew up with a dog or a cat. Um, I, I did not, um, but when... For most of my childhood, when I was a teenager, uh, my parents adopted a an adult German Shepherd mix from a shelter, and that I mean th that really did it for me. And you know, a short time later, I was googling PETA. Um, you know, of course, things were much different uh, fifteen twenty years ago, but um, that you know, and that was that truly was my connection to PETA was was my my dog and getting to know, you know, getting to know an animal and care for an animal and seeing their, um, their excitement, their wide variety of emotions. And, um, you know, and that, that did it for me. And then, um, I have been at PETA more or less ever since. And your, and your dog's name was? Sam. Sam, you think about Sam? I do. I actually still have a picture of them on my desk here at, at the PETA office. Yeah. I mean, it's funny how that happens. Is there always, you know, one special companion. I, I have this uh, one dog who uh, passed away about a couple, couple years now. And, uh, you know, I still have a picture of my dog, Ross, you know, I, I never forget, uh, Ross, the McNabb Border Collie. <laughs> but now you see dogs all the time. Now, is there one dog that in your current capacity as a community animal project member that that you have seen and who has touched you and reminds you that, hey, Emily, you're doing this not just for Sam, but you're doing it mm -hmm. for this dog, too, and all dogs? Yeah, that that's the exciting part about my job is that, you know, number one, every day is is different. Um, it's definitely not a mundane job. Every day you um, deal with a, a different address, a different city, a different household, a different dog. And um, the, the exciting part is you do get to rescue animals directly. And uh, although this work can be gut wrenching and it is hard to leave a dog at, you know, at the end of the chain, even if they have been spayed or neutered, even if they have a dog house, even if they have a lightweight chain, even if they have straw bedding, it is still really emotionally gut wrenching to say goodbye to them and, you know, leave them when you leave work at the end of the day. But the, the exciting part is that many of the dogs that we, um, we visit day in and day out have ultimately been relinquished to PETA or to a, a local animal shelter or local SPCA in hopes of trying to um, get that dog into a better situation. And uh, I know uh, one of my coworkers recently, we, we, all of us field workers, we have quite a few dogs that are, um, you know, we say, quote unquote, favorites. Um, and all of us do, but there's several dogs who all of us, you know, routinely talk about and routinely visit and we, you know, make plans for when the day comes that we do get them relinquished. And, you know, whether that means one of us foster the dog until we find a, a new home or transfer the dog to a local SPCA. But one of my favorite dogs that I've met in the field was a dog named Miss Willie. And unfortunately, she was chained outside for her entire life, 10 plus years. And she was a dog we've made hundreds and hundreds of field visits to. And she lived in a community where chaining was still legal. And um, over the course of the years, we helped spay her. We provided her with a free dog house. We um, would 
every summer bring her flea and tick medication and make sure she had fresh food and water. And um, this past summer, the day finally came where we we did get her relinquished. And one of my coworkers took took Miss Willie home for the duration of her lifetime, which unfortunately wasn't all too long to, but to, to finally show her the, the love that she had deserved her entire life. So it's Miss Willie that inspires you. Well, there's, uh, there's too many to list that inspire me, but she's a story that really sticks out. And she was a dog. Well, I still think about, but who I thought about constantly when she was outside. And now as the temperature drops and it gets colder, I guess there are potentially more dogs out there who will be endangered and need need help. That's true. And every week we go into those communities and you don't know what the week will bring you. And um, we we try to make their living conditions the best that we can. And and the ultimate goal is to, to either have the owner or the guardian bring the animal indoors or or hopefully get them relinquished so they do have a chance at at living in an indoor only home. As we close, for people who might know of dogs who are chained, uh, what can they do and how can we save some some animals lives with during this cold snap? I think it's important for people never to turn a blind eye to an animal who's left outdoors in in freezing temperature and we may be their only chance at survival and simply calling the authorities may save that animal's life. And so if you know of a a dog or a cat who's being kept outside in extreme weather, report it to authorities. And if if they don't do anything, then report it to PETA. We um, we're lucky enough here at PETA. We have a, a casework division that deals with these kind of calls from all across the country. And, uh, we deal with law enforcement and, to uh, try to better the living conditions for these animals and either get the animals seized or bring the animals indoors. Yeah. But there's stuff that you can do. You can't, you you can't just walk away. You can't just ignore a situation like that. If you see it, if you're aware. Yeah. and And make a phone call and, you know, don't, don't delay because you may be that animal's only hope. If you See something, say something. That's, you know, that's always a good rule of thumb. Even for dogs and cats that you might see out there in frigid temperatures. Okay. Hey, Emily, I I really thank you for your time here. And thanks for being on the PETA podcast. Oh, thank you. Emily Allen with PETA's Community Animal Project. Be careful out there. Remember, if it's too cold for humans, it's too cold for animals. Bring them indoors. Save a life. Call law enforcement or contact PETA. For links to more information, go to our show notes or to PETA.org. And that's our program for today. You can contact us at PETA.org. Find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on AMOK.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa, Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.